You're listening to Psych with Mike. For more episodes or to connect with the show with comments, ideas, or to be a guest, go to www.psychwithmike.com. Follow the show on Twitter at Psych with Mike or like the Facebook page at Psych with Mike. Now, here's Psych with Mike. All right, that's the right button. Welcome into the Psych with Mike library. This is Dr. Michael Mahan, and I am here on the phone with Mr. Brett Newcomb. Hello again. How are you doing? I'm doing well. So uh, I called you and said that I am, um, I don't want to say angry because that's probably too strong a statement, but perturbed. I am perturbed. Yeah, I'm perturbed. Yeah, I'm uh, a wordsmith. Yeah. I'm actually a professional wordsmith. Yeah. Um, can you make a horse smith shoe? Uh, not a, not on the radio, no. <laughs> oh, wordsmith is different than a blacksmith. Yeah, I think so. Okay. I'll, I'll just throw a few words together. I don't gotcha. have to nail them on anything, yeah. So I'm perturbed because, uh, well, for a couple of reasons. So number one is that um, I hear people saying things about social distancing, which A, I don't like because I wish we would say physical distancing because I think the social distancing is leading people to believe that we should all be afraid of each other. Um, but number two... Well, that's because, that's because words matter. I mean, half of yeah. our job is explaining to people that words matter. Yeah. And, and counselors and therapists, and if they have to use words, they need to use them properly and well. And so then words matter. You had told me, why don't you tell me what you heard AOC to say today? Well, I saw a quick blurb on my news feed that she made the statement that because gas came in today, oil came in today at a negative price. They actually had to pay people to take their oil. Uh, which is a concept that I don't really understand in economics. But she said that was an indicator, as I understood her comment, that was an indicator that we now were positioned to begin the journey away from fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And I had said to you that and the thing that I'm upset about, which is that I heard a doctor being interviewed today who said that social distancing uh, has kept down the spread of the coronavirus those two statements are so ridiculous that they they shouldn't be uttered and when you hear people say things like that when i hear people say things like that uh i wonder why those people are given microphones well so but then you have to think about what is your audience and what is your message because you as a purist argue about those uh, mm -hmm. factual differences or interpretive differences and you lose sight of what is the main message that you want to put out. And the main message that you want to put out is that we are taking baby steps to try to fight something that we can't see because we don't have enough data to help us really fight it. And so we're shooting craps. We're, we're throwing the dice and hoping that we roll a winning point, that we get a win and defeat the virus or reduce the numbers of of infected people, reduce the numbers of death, re increase the numbers of survivors, find the people with the antibodies, get their blood, you know, just spread it around. We, we want to do all those things, but we don't have accurate data. And without accurate data, you can't have science. Exactly. So uh, the reason why the statement social distancing is keeping down the spread is is a little bit Incorrect. disturbing to me for two reasons. Number one is... Yeah. Social distancing was never meant to stop the spread. It was meant to slow it down so that the hospitals didn't become overwhelmed. And number two, we don't know how many people have been infected because we can't test anybody. Without right. knowing how many people have been infected, you can't say whether or not we've slowed the spread. Right. It you, could be you we've all no been infected. Right. right. And if we've all been infected, then social distancing has had no effect whatsoever. So I really, it really infuriates me to hear people say that. But okay, so but let's just talk about the psychology of it. So, <laughs> not the furious part of it, the yeah, psychology. Part of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you believe that it is better for people to hear somebody go on the radio and say something reassuring, even if it's ridiculous? Or would it be better for them to say, "Look, we just can't really give you any any information because we just don't know." 
I believe, especially when you're trying to solve a problem, that facts matter more than anything else. If you don't have data and you don't have facts, then no matter what you say, it isn't helpful to me. Mm -hmm. Now, if the goal is, I mean, it's been, again, you have to define all your terms. If what we're trying to do is smooth out people's anxieties and quiet down their concerns, then I think words from leaders help if they believe, if we as people believe in the leader. Mm -hmm. If we think that the leader, the leader is uh, somebody who has strength and capacity and passion and momentum in their guidance of us, then we become avid and happy followers. Mm -hmm. And when they tell us, calm down, be, be still, this is going to get better because we're, we're fighting the fight, the good fight, then we embrace that. We, we embrace that message. We say, yes, hallelujah, let's go, let's do that. If we don't believe them, if we have evidence that they are not trustworthy, that they are not good leaders, then we get angry because we're being lied to or being manipulated. Mm -hmm. So the, the challenge in, in the question that you ask is, for my response, is, is there any data? Is there any evidence that tells us this person knows what they're doing, that they're not lying to us? And that's a real challenge for me. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, my concern is, so we already saw the very beginnings of people becoming discontent with the effort to emotionally distance. So we had some protests over the weekend. And what I'm concerned... So, so again, let's be careful about our terms. Because I think everybody is discontented with feeling trapped by a quarantine. Okay. Not being able to go to a store, not being able to hang out with friends or have a barbecue or a party. Or, you know, those things, if we're being good to the idea of social distancing, mm -hmm. are difficult over time. And, and we're seeing more and more information come out about kids getting abused, domestic mm -hmm. disputes, problems that people living in small and closed spaces are having because they can't get away from each other. Mm -hmm. So if you're talking about that and people being upset about that, I'll embrace that 100% and say yes, amen. But if you're talking about people being politically upset because they're putting interpretations on what they hear to fit a political agenda, like if this is about the Second Amendment, get your gun. You know, go out in, on the street corner, stand with your gun, because the government's trying to come for your gun. That's all bullshit. Mm -hmm. They can't say that to me and get any kind of receptive audience. Mm -hmm. I just don't buy it. And obviously, the things that happened over the weekend were politically motivated. We know that they have to be. That's always going to well, be. It's obvious to you, and it's obvious to me. I don't think it's obvious to the state of Oklahoma or mm -hmm. Nebraska. Well, that's unfortunate. Then they probably believe that social distancing is keeping down the spread of the virus, too. No, um, they probably believe the whole thing is a hoax. Well, that's, yeah. Because that's, they don't live in big cities with, with high dense populations and, and hospitals that you can overload with cases. They live in places that don't have hospitals. But that's what, so that was something that I was talking about earlier today with somebody is that we're going to have very, very different perceptual realities of what this event was like, depending on what our zip code is. If you live in New Absolutely. York, this is horrible. If yeah. you live here in Missouri, it's not really that bad. And if you live in you know, Oklahoma, in the middle of nowhere, and you don't have anybody around you for miles and miles and miles, you're wondering why everybody's making such a fuss. Well, you're listening to a right-wing radio commentators that say, that those refrigerator trucks that supposedly have bodies in them, that's a hoax. And, and that the people that are wanting to lock down America and make it go broke and, and ruin it are putting this hoax out. And so then I wonder, when we come to the end of the quarantine phase, and people start going back to work, those who still have jobs, right. other people are going right. to be looking for work, there's going to be some people who are going to say, you know, I had to sacrifice my $100,000 a year job, and for what? My, my life is destroyed, and right. what did we gain by that? And the economy is going to be in shambles, and I think people are going to be disgruntled and i'm afraid of what people what what's i mean not i don't think we're going to have a rev, rev, revolution i don't think people are going to as you say get their guns and you know go want to overthrow the government but i do think that there are going to be a lot of angry 
uh, dissatisfied people, and I don't know what's going to happen when that when we get to that point. Well, the key there is to have good leadership. If you have good leaders, they can guide and shape the conversation. Mm -hmm. And if they do their job and they help lead us towards wisdom and and thought as we try to solve the problems that we face, then we get away from mob psychology and mm -hmm. hysteria and let's man the ramparts and shoot somebody. And just to uh, promote the future, we're going to have Eric Kaufman on uh, next week, and he is going to talk to us about leadership, and maybe he'll be able to shine some light on this subject. He that's kind of his area of expertise, and I and I that's why I want to talk to him uh, about yeah, exactly hopefully. this. But you know, for me and you today, uh, for people who are beginning to feel disgruntled and starting to wonder why are we doing this my life has really been negatively affected. What would you say to somebody in that situation? You're right. It has been. It's scary. These are scary times. Part of what we are facing with this problem is an increasing awareness of the huge holes that exist in the fabric of American society. And we have to ask ourselves now as a society, do we want to do something to heal these holes, to fill these gaps? Do we want to change the way we understand poverty? Do we want to change the way that we understand homelessness? Do we want to change the way that we understand health care? Mm -hmm. What is the right answer when we face a problem of this magnitude that brings us forward as people and a country? And so I want leaders who are talking about those concepts more than trying to assign blame or trying to avoid responsibility, or trying to make uh, progress for uh, an individual agenda like mm -hmm. abortion. Mm -hmm. You know, this is my opportunity to seize the day and win the fight. I don't want that kind of leadership. I want the kind of leadership that says, we are in this together. We are all part of a family, a large family with multiple interests and multiple capacities, and we have to make our nation work. And so what do we need to do and instead of single issue targets? That's what I want too. I, I, I want exactly that, but I don't see that being promoted or projected. So I don't see that anywhere. Yeah. So where do we, can we find that or can we make that for ourselves? Can we believe the, that? The closest that leaders... I've seen to that has been Andrew Cuomo in his daily press conferences, mm -hmm. talking about how, the state of New York is, is dealing with this virus on a daily basis and what kind of problems need to be solved and how we need to help each other as community. Uh, I don't see other national leaders saying these things or addressing these mm -hmm. things, and it concerns me. Mm -hmm. But for us, if we're seeing clients and we're talking to them about their anxiety, what we, what do we tell them? I've been saying, you know what, uh, I believe in the message that you just espoused, which is we're in this together. We are a, we can choose to be a family. We can choose to be a community. I would like to see people trying to do that, do that more, uh, more sincerely. I wish that we could get that message promoted on a larger scale. I would suggest that people try to embrace uh, reality and that they calm themselves down. It doesn't do any good to get all wound up and get hyperventilating and excited and distraught about something. Uh, there are things that they can do that they can learn about the virus, that they can learn about themselves and their household and their community. It can contribute. For instance, right now there are a lot of people that don't have incomes and have families to feed. Mm -hmm. So food pantries are of critical importance. If you want to do something helpful, contribute to a food pantry, mm -hmm. either with cash or with service. Go down and load bags of food, hand them out, volunteer, do something that helps your neighbor. If you know an older person that lives down the street, maybe somebody that's been sick or somebody that's widowed or that lives alone, check in, see if they need a loaf of bread, see if they're doing okay. Do they have toilet paper? Is there anything that you can do to make their life better? One of the things that we tell people when they're obsessed with depression, woe is me, I'm depressed. Take care of somebody else. Mm -hmm. Invest in somebody else. Mm -hmm. Get outside of your own myopic vision mm -hmm. of preoccupation. 
And I would say the same thing. If all of us could step outside of that and quit trying to prove that we're right, but try to look around and say, how can I contribute? How can I help? How can I do no harm? Mm -hmm. Then I think we make progress. I feel like that's a shot. Well, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it as well. <laughs> well, no, just uh, that, that you're saying to me, hey, stop stop trying to be right. Just go out and do something nice for somebody. I feel like my wife tells me that a lot. I didn't mean to send that. Uh, <laughs> it's not my perspective. Uh, now, perception of you. I may just, but, I may just yeah, be... But hey, the, if the uh, shoe fits. Yeah, I may just be sensitive to it because... Like I said, well, I think I my wife tells me. Yeah, and, and I do too. And, I, and I've been really promoting that with clients is, you know, have you done anything to try and feel more integrated into the process of the solution? Yeah. And, you know, I don't think that we're thinking about that really. And I want people to hear that message. I wish that people would think that way just naturally but i think that what the way that the media is presenting things when you only hear the negative and everybody's trying to ramp that up then well and, and you know it's kind of like we tell people don't do comparative misery and have, clients will come in and say well i'm not worthy of your time i'm not mm -hmm. worthy to take time to talk about this because you know my mother didn't die of cancer or whatever the, the thing is and i tell them look if you are suffering you are in pain we need to address your pain. You can't mm -hmm. compare it to somebody else's pain. And the same thing happens with this kind of conversation. How can I contribute? How can I help? Well, my help isn't as important as somebody else's help. I can't be a doctor. I can't do surgery. I'm not a nurse. I can't go put a ventilator in somebody that needs one. So what I would say to them is, what can you do? Mm -hmm. Can you cut somebody's grass? Mm -hmm. Can you donate $10 to a food pantry? Can you wash a car? I mean, what can you do? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. What mm -hmm. can I do to help somebody else? So start asking that question every day. And start thinking about it. Start thinking that way. If you start thinking that way, that eventually can become pervasive. You start thinking that way, you're going to start talking like that to people that are in your sphere of influence. Then that might spark something in them. They might start talking that way. And pretty soon that becomes the national mentality. What can I do to try and help somebody? That's why I hate the idea of the word social distancing, because I think that it promotes this idea we should be afraid of each other and I think exactly the opposite I think that we should be trying to find opportunities if you don't want to go be in somebody's sphere within six feet that's okay you don't need to be within six feet of somebody to go cut their grass or as you said right. go wash their car so there's things that we can do to try and be a proactive part of the solution that right. don't have anything to do with putting ourselves in danger amen I agree yeah, But we need to be thoughtful about it, and we need to be deliberate about it and conscious in our efforts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so uh, as a, a last parting thought for people who are starting to feel the wear and tear of, you know, a month and now looking at maybe another several couple of weeks, at least, if not another month of this quarantine, what do you say to people to keep them because I feel like you know we're, we're, we're starting to get stale right the initial hey we're gonna go do something and we're gonna all band together has worn off now people are starting to think about the consequences starting to think about oh now I've been with the same people for four weeks and my tolerance is starting to wear down what can we encourage people to think about to make it fresh again I don't know I don't know what will work uh, because people do numb out no matter what their endurance capacity is. They reach a saturation point. What I would say is be good to yourself. Mm -hmm. Treat yourself in some way. Uh, things that you like or that give you comfort, indulge in those things, whether it's reading a book or listening to a, a classical music or country music or whatever it might be. Do something that makes you feel good about you. Mm-hmm. And I and, still go ahead. Well, it just keep going one foot in front of the other, one day at a time, one step at a time. And I'm still really, really encouraging people to think about 
going out and doing creative things, engaged, think about some kind of creative process that you would be interested in trying to pick up that maybe you've never done before, or maybe that you put down and haven't done in a while. If you are in that creative side of your brain, number one, you're out of the rational side of your brain, which is good to take a break from during all of this. But number two, I think that that is something that invigorates us. You know, yeah. uh, start doing the crossword puzzle, start doing Sudoku, uh, start- Shine your shoes. It, it doesn't matter, shine your right. shoes. Right, 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 right. Your silver, uh, do something that you don't normally do. And that's something busy and active. Right. That that we haven't been encouraging enough is to continue to engage in a regular kind of activity of daily living schedule. Get up, yeah. take a shower, get, get dressed. dressed. Yes. Don't wear sweats all, all day long. All day. Right. Comb your hair, brush mm -hmm. your teeth, be ready to face the world. Exactly. Then and then sit down and read a book. Well, I'm um, absolutely, but you know that's so important to get up, brush your teeth, comb your hair, take a shower, get dressed, and like you're saying, shine your shoes. You know, uh, right now we should all be able to have really, really good looking shoes, right? Yeah. Because we Amen. don't usually have enough time to shine those shoes. So, yeah, get out, do those things. Well, if not get out, at least get up and do those things. But then also I would encourage people to think about a creative process because I think that that is a really positive way to get yourself re-energized. My, my wife and I are making a determined effort every single day to walk between four and six miles. Mm -hmm. The weather is nice. We get out and we'll go do that. We don't have to mix with anybody or get close to mm -hmm. anybody, but we can do that. And that's good for our health. Absolutely. It takes... Uh, an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes. Uh, it's time well spent, and we reap benefits from mm -hmm. it. Well, especially because the gyms are closed. A lot of people started yeah. this off if they're not still eating a lot of comfort food because things were really scary. So, yeah, getting out now that the weather is starting to break, at least here in the Midwest, I'm sure there are some places where it's still cold. But, uh, yeah, that is that is a huge thing and so, so, so positive. All right. Hopefully uh, that was good for people. And um, as always, if you have any comments or questions about the show, you want to get a hold of us or possibly let us know something that you would like to hear us talk about, you can get us at psychwithmike.com. Please, 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 if you think that what we're doing is beneficial and you enjoy it, tell a couple of friends, tell five friends, tell 12 friends. Um, during the uh, quarantine would be a great time for people to really get caught up on all their psych with Mike. And as always, <laughs> yeah, that's a good thing. Uh, yeah. As always, if it's Friday, it's psych with Mike.